Welcome to Recalculating Small Business. What we think our small companies are, are worth, others will often disagree. At the same, same time, there's much to be learned about each company's financials. Here to talk about this and more is w- one of my favorite guests, Jerry Mills. He's the uh, founder and CEO of B2B CFO. Uh, he's here because he has a fantastic new program for small business leaders to learn about the true value of their enterprise and more. Jerry, welcome to our program. Well, thank you. Good to be here. Uh, I understand you're in New York t- uh, today t- talking to the Financial Writers Association, but but you're also here to talk about uh, y- your new program. Why don't I just turn the uh, platform over to you and t- tell us a little bit about uh, both things and and, uh, and we'll go from there. Okay, well, thank you. Well, uh, we've created a new uh, program called the Business Sales Solution, and the reason we created it is uh, if you put yourself in the shoes of uh, business owners who are thinking about possibly selling their business, uh, what are their options? They usually go to seminars, and these seminars are put on by high-pressure salespeople, and these salespeople typically want something, they want to, they want a check for thirty five to sixty thousand dollars so they can look at a company to see what it's worth and 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 our our values are education and so we've created this uh free educational uh workshop uh we don't ask for any money in fact we advise business owners don't write a check to anybody uh and what the, what we're trying to do is teach them educate them on the pros and cons and also the traps of selling their business. Well, keep keep on uh, uh, going. I'm going to start, and then turn uh, after this one question, then turn it over to Dan, because um, as you know, um, I'm uh, you you might not know, but Dan knows. I'm I'm on the board of a, a medical marijuana nonprofit here in New Jersey, and we're in the process of raising money, and it's fascinating how people have come in and and varied the valuation of of uh, our company, our nonprofit. In, in, ter- for, uh, in terms of the, their uh, um, uh, investment. My question to you is, what are the uh, one or two things you should do first b- uh, before you, uh, you even start the process? Well, uh, before you even start the process, um, my advice to um, business owners is to contemplate what type of uh, buyer would eventually buy them I'm not talking about specifically a specific company. For example, would it be a strategic buyer? They usually offer the highest multiple uh, or value. Would it be a financial buyer? Would it be a private equity group? What kind of buyer uh, would eventually buy your business? And the reason that's important is because the type of buyer, again, whether they're strategic, financial, private equity, or or whomever, offer different uh, multiples of EBITDA, different valuations, in other words. And uh, and they do that for for their own purposes. Strategic buyers, for example, uh, will often buy at a very high level because they have a strategic motive. Uh, they may want to increase market share. They may want to acquire knowledge. Uh, they may want to prevent a competitor from coming into a market. And so they're less uh, bottom line oriented in terms of a purchase. On the other hand, a financial buyer, or specifically a private equity group, are very financially motivated, and uh, a lot of their reason is they want to buy a company at the lowest possible price so that in two to four years they can basically flip the company and and make a return, and typically they're trying to get a return of 21 to 30 percent. So they're very motivated to cram the valuation down to its lowest possible uh, dollar so they can flip it. So one of the, uh, the things that we start out is, is, is sort of the, the, the saying, begin with the end in mind. Well, what do you want? Uh, do you want to, uh, a certain dollar amount? Uh, do you want to maintain your employees? What, what are the values uh, that you want out of the company? Is it a legacy company where you want the, uh, the name and, and the legacy of the company to continue. Well, all of those, 
uh, uh, values are subject to different types of buyers. Uh, and so what we do is, uh, again, let's start out with the end in mind, and let's try to first find out what kind of buyer, what type of buyer is what we call it, is in your best interest, and then we go from there. That's really a great answer. Dan, it's all yours. Thank you. Good morning, sir, and thank you for joining us today. Hi. Um, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm listening to your comments with Don, and I'm reminded of a, a friend of mine who's in the real estate business. And uh, she and her, I've known her husband for decades, and, and uh, just met her since we moved to Christina about full time. Um, but she's in the real estate business, and and uh, she said that when people want to put their house on the market, they have sometimes unrealistic expectations of what the property is worth. So she starts every day by saying to the let's get an independent third party appraisal of what they would appraise the property. And I, you're breaking up a lot. I'm having a hard time hearing the question. So was your question, am I seeing a lot of companies being started, or what was the, what was the other question? Well, do, do we have a situation where, do, we, do you see a situation where there's uh, growing interest in starting businesses and also interest uh, recently where there are more businesses for sale than there have been for a long time? So are we seeing both things? both dynamics working right now where we've got starting new and selling old? Okay. Well, well what we're seeing, obviously, uh, startups are popular. There are a lot of barriers for them to get into the, the market today that didn't exist in the past. As far as uh, the demand for companies that are selling, what we're faced with and what, uh, is something that we have, that's never happened in the history of mankind and that's the volume of businesses that are owned by baby boomers. And those baby boomers um, have, have a problem that their forefathers didn't have, that, and that problem is their children don't want to take over their business. They don't want to work as hard or they want to do other things. And so just by the nature of the volume of baby boomers, we are seeing a lot of companies that want to sell. Now, wanting to sell and selling are, are two different things. Uh, last year, according to the Capital IQ, there were only 9,129 9, U.S.-based privately held companies sold, and that was a an 8% decrease from 2015. And so we're, we are seeing more and more interest of companies being uh, wanting to sell, uh, but the problem is they don't know how to sell, they have wrong financial information, they have the wrong advisors, and they um, are running into barriers in, in order to uh, close a transaction. And so there, there's a lot of frustration, obviously. And it, we we're actually seeing a decrease in the number of sales of privately held businesses because of this uh, genre or this issue uh, that they don't know the process. They don't know who they want to sell to. They have wrong or bad financial information. They have a, uh, an expectation of what the company is worth. And usually that expectation is materially different than what somebody will buy the company for. Now, that doesn't mean the value is not there. It, what it really means is, for the most part, they're not presenting the value the proper way, and uh, they're not, uh, uh, they, they don't have the knowledge in order to present a company and, that might garner a top dollar. And so there's high demand to sell. Uh, but there's uh, these barriers that business owner, owners put up in front of them themselves, basically, to prevent them from selling companies. One of the then things. I, I, can I just jump in and ask a follow up question? But, Jerry, what are some of the things that uh, an, an owner should do to present the, the best possible uh, foot forward? Well, that's a great question. Um, business owners, I, I teach them the catch-22 uh, concept. They're they're in a catch-22. So they have a an, they own a company, and for the majority, we're talking about U.S.-based privately held companies. 
And we live in a, a world of confiscatory taxes, federal tax, state tax, local tax. And some of these taxes can exceed 50%. And so they have a, a very big incentive to put personal and other uh, expenses into the profit and loss in order to reduce their taxable income. Well, that may work in, 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 the, in regard of reducing taxable income, but what that does simultaneously, and this is where the Catch-22 comes in, it devalues the company. And so, uh, and they don't understand that. They, they just say, well, wait a minute, we're, we're trying to save taxes, therefore we're going to put some expenses in the P&L or income saver that we may normally not put in in order to save hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes. But they don't understand that, that, that go, doing that way uh, and, and, and putting aside whether that may <laughs> be fit into the category of tax evasion, let's just put that away uh, on the side. Just the fact of lowering their their income, filing a tax return, signing it. Well, when a company comes in to possibly buy them, they use that lower number. And then if they're using a multiple of EBITDA or any other type of valuation that relies upon financial information, the company could be worth uh, millions of dollars less than the business owner thinks that it's worth. And it's because, because of this genre of... Uh, of trying to save some dollars uh, on federal, state, and local taxation. And it's a, it's a huge uh, pitfall the business owners uh, fall into. And then they don't understand the process. Uh, sometimes in the market it's called normal, normalization. They don't understand the process of how to normalize things to uh, show the company what it would look like if, it did, if it, those kind of expenses were not – buried on the profit and loss statement. Back to you, Dan. I just wanted to follow up. Sure, no problem. Um, in fact, uh, I would agree with you, Jerry. My son tells me that the biggest problem that he sees in these small privately held businesses that he's trying to do ESOP transactions with is uh, of the reliability of the books in the company. But I want to go back to you and, and this new program that you have. Uh, tell us how our listeners, the small business people, can benefit from your, your new service. Well, this new service, they benefit significantly. First, we give them a, a complimentary copy of, of our book, the Exit Strategy Handbook. It's the best handbook in terms of education in the nation. And then we walk them through this, this process. It's okay. Are you unintentionally devaluing your business, and what can you do to get it get it back valued back to the way that it should look like before a buyer comes in? And it's almost analogous to selling a home. Well, if you want to sell a home and get top dollar, usually we do things. We, we uh, do the landscaping, we paint it, we may need to remodel the kitchen. Well, in the case of a business, we're not talking about painting the building and remodeling the, uh, the flooring, what we're talking about is, is taking financial information, balance sheet, profit and loss statement, income statement, and first we're trying to see that it's accurate, because usually it's not. Uh, in, in my experience in doing this uh, for almost 40 years, I've yet to go into a privately held company that issues pro internal financial statements to see uh, them accurate. They're always wrong. Well, if they're wrong, uh, and they're understated in terms of income. Well, a buyer has a golden opportunity to buy something at a very much at a, at a, a lower price. And so, what we do is teach them: okay, l let's first get accurate information. What does that even mean? Uh, let's get timely information. What does that mean? Uh, let's look at the uh, best type of buyer. Uh, and and the, the biggest thing, the biggest obstacle that we see is bone owners try to sell their business while they're operating their business. And that is a very difficult thing to do. And what they don't do is they don't surround themselves with team members who have been there, who have done that, that are working in the owner's best interest. And uh, because a, an owner may be working 60 or 70 hours a week already, just uh, taking care of normal business, you know, payroll, uh, dealing with governmental issues, customers, uh, accounts payable, HR, so forth. Now, if they do it by themselves, they're looking at another 40 or 50 hours a week on top of that. 
Well, that's a formula for disaster. And there are, are professionals that can be hired at a reasonable rate. A lot of times they'll take their uh, fee at closing, conditional upon closing. And so they have an incentive to help the business owner uh, close the transaction. And what the business owner needs to do is, uh, is get, we call this a maze. They need to get through the maze in a, in a specific period of time, but they need to have help, people helping them get through the maze so that they can operate their, uh, their company uh, properly. I have a statement in one of my books that 80% of failed transactions are because of declining financial uh, activity during the period of which a buyer is looking at a company, 80%. So what we do is try to teach that and teach how to, uh, to grow a business. In fact, when a company is going through a transaction, the number one uh, goal, the number one job of a business owner is to grow sales and grow company value. Well, if they take their eye off the ball, if they're not dealing with their customers, their employees, and their costs, the company financial information is going to decline, and the buyer is either going to walk away or – they're going to offer a significantly lower price, and that lower price may turn into millions of dollars. We have to stop here a moment. Uh, Jerry, how do people find your website, uh, uh, where are these uh, seminars? Give us some uh, uh, details for our listening audience. Uh, they go to our website, uh, b2bcfo.com. That's B as in boy, the number two, B as in boy, cfo.com. And there's a place to register for the free comp- for the free seminars, um, and uh, they can just sign up. We're uh, in all the contiguous 48 states, and so we would just uh, email them and invite them to the next seminar. There's no cost. Uh, it, it, uh, in fact, we, we give away complimentary information. So they just go to our website and, and sign up and register for it. We're here with Jerry Mills, B2B. CFO.com. He's got what I think is a wonderful new program uh, of helping people sell their companies, which uh, listening to him and and knowing a little bit about uh, myself is a a very difficult and arduous uh, task. Uh, Dan, back to you. Thank you, Don. Uh, Jerry, uh, in the opening, Don mentioned that you're not only doing your free seminar, but you're in to meet with the financial writers here in uh, there in New York City. Uh, what are you are talking to them about? I've been invited to speak to about 100 reporters tomorrow afternoon, and uh, what they, they, I'm, and I'm trying to solve a, a frustration that they have. They are used to dealing with uh, publicly traded companies, of which there are only 8,000. And of those 8,000, only 4,300 are, are actually traded on the market. Well, if you look at the privately held business, there's, there's 20 million of us. Uh, there's 5 million with payroll of five, five people or more. There's 160,000 that have sales between 9 million and uh, 350 million. And these reporters uh, do not understand how to talk to us because uh, they can't go online and get financial information. They feel that uh, there's a lack of transparency, and there really is not a lack of transparency. What there really is, and what I'm going to teach them, is there's a lack of communication, a lack of understanding. They'll demand, for example, and it's understandable why they do that, because they can go online for pu- public companies and get a balance sheet and a profit loss, and those things are audited, and there's disclosure that the SEC requires. Well, they're expecting and they're demanding the same thing of uh, private held businesses, and that's just not the way we work. We don't allow strangers to come in, uh, regardless of how good they are. They may be with a very reputable magazine or, or TV station or, or, or a newspaper and ask for financial and other information. Well, we, we close down at that point and do not give information, and the press is frustrated. So what I'm trying to do is teach them the proper way to communicate with us so, they, so they're less frustrated, how to find out the really cool stories that are out with us that they don't hear because we're private. So I'm, I'm there to um, basically, uh, they've asked me to, uh, to talk about 
the gold or, you know, the really cool stories that can be found with privately held companies, and they're very frustrated about it. So I'm there to help take some of the frustration away. So do you find that it's difficult for small businesses, not so much that they need to release financial information, but um, sometimes they're too private? Well, uh, they are too private uh, to a certain degree. Uh, and, and let me give you a very quick example. Uh, my company has been an uh, award winner for four years on the Inc. 5,000 fastest growing companies in America. It took uh, my public relations firm five years to let to talk to me and let and let me disclose our sales. I didn't want to disclose any information, and so what I was doing is I was losing publicity and the opportunity to get awards for my company because I did not want others, uh, particularly competitors, to know financial information about our company. So yeah, we can be a little um, too private because. Getting in the Inc. 500, 5,000, getting other awards, and, and by the way, there's also a lot of industry awards. Most of, most private health companies are in, in industry groups, and, and and what a wonderful way to be introduced to not only their peers but to for vendors, for people who have money or, and or potential buyers. So we we can be a little too uh, we can hold things a little bit close to the chest, and sometimes it's not always in our best interest. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say this that uh, actually I have been guilty of that myself. So the answer to that is a resounding yes. And, and that extends to family members. I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. The, the playing it close to the vest, the owner, not disclosing a lot of information even to family members. Well, the fear of a lot of business owners have, uh, even when there's uh, key management that may include family members, they don't want to release any information. Uh, one of the primary reasons is because they, let's say we have a profitable year. Well, if we disclose that information to key people, key employees, including family members, there, there's a fear, a sort of a built-in fear, if you would, that they may ask for more money. Uh, you know, salary raises, perks, and auto, or or whatever it is, and that's usually a um, not a correct fear. M most people work for a privately held business because they believe in the the person at the top. I mean, they they really believe in that person, and they and they're not there just for money. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, and sometimes we're guilty of that. The other thing that's difficult too with privately held companies in terms of disclosure as opposed to public. If you go online and see a publicly traded company, you see um, the bottom line is after tax, net after tax. Mm -hmm. Well, with a privately held company, if you see the bottom line, that's pre-tax because that money mostly is going to go pass through in an S corp, an LLC, an LLP, a sole proprietorship, and so that number, and the business owner knows that that's a false number in terms of uh, somebody seeing it, let's say the, the bottom line is a million dollars. Well, the company really didn't make a million dollars because that's pre-tax uh, uh, that's going to be passed through to the owner, and the tax may be 40 to 50 percent. And so uh, we have a tendency to want to uh, uh, guard that uh, <laughs> almost to, to the bitter end, uh, to not share information with, uh, with people. Um, uh, and, and sometimes that is to our detriment. Right. I mean, uh, let me, Dan, I, I want to jump in because we're running close, and we promised uh, uh, Jerry that uh, we'd get him off. Um, but I have to ask a question: Are, are you involved when when uh, there are two or three children involved, and then uh, uh, either the founder dies or wants to give it give it away or uh, pass it on? And what are some of the things you would suggest um, uh, pe uh, people do in a situation like that? Well, at a minimum, uh, the owner has to have uh, key men life insurance to help perpetuate the company. So they have to have that. The other thing, the owner needs a plan, a succession plan, to uh, in the case of an uninventional death. That's what my company has. I have basically a board of directors. And if I uh, prematurely die, 
Uh, there's a very large E&O policy. Uh, my company has no debt, but it's a very, very large E&O policy. And then that, the, the uh, we call them the executive committee. They'll turn into a board of directors. They know exactly my wishes. It's in writing. They know exactly uh, what amount they need to pay to my estate, my family, my wife and children, if you would. And they also know that I want to perpetuate the company. And so that, that advanced planning is critical. And, and, and probably 99% of business owners don't do that. Is if you don't have I was just about planning, to say that. Yeah. If you don't have the advanced planning, and let's say, for example, a business owner is, is single for whatever reason, divorce, a wife died, well, then uh, if they're not careful, the Internal Revenue Service is going to come in, and they're going to value the company, and they're going to uh, ask for a pound of flesh. That's what happened to the Joe Robbie family. They lost the Miami Dolphins because uh, Joe Robbie died, didn't have uh, this planning in, in, uh, in place. And so his family, which was supposed to inherit and run the Miami Dolphins, ended up having to sell the stadium and, and the team in order to pay the IRS the 50-plus percent that it wanted for, for, for the estate tax. So uh, that advanced planning is critical. Uh, otherwise, it just devastates lives. Uh, the employees, vendors, just family, everybody it just devastates lives. Uh, Dan, you get to ask the last question. Um, I want to go back to the, the generational issue. Um, uh, you talked about how many baby boomers are interested in selling their business, but you also mentioned the fact that, that children uh, and perhaps even grandchildren may not be interested in the business. Um, how big a problem is that? It's, uh, it's serious. I don't, obviously, we don't have the stats on it, but I would say in, uh, in being in business, uh, that's the majority, and by majority, it's probably more than 60 or 70 percent. The the uh, the children they've seen their forefathers or their parents work, uh, you know, 50, 60, 70 hours a week. They don't want to work that hard. They don't want the business. They also want to work with gadgets and technology. And so, the old days, 40, 50 years ago, it was just assumed that the ch- child or children would take over the business, and today that isn't happening. Uh, and so there has to be more of an emphasis on what's going to happen. Who's the company going to be sold to? Is it going to be sold, for example, in a transfer to, in an ESOP to the employees? Uh, wh- where, what's going to happen to the business? Because the children aren't going to take it over. Wow. Thank you. Uh, well, Jerry, got, you have uh, to come, uh, come. I don't know how you feel, Dan, but we have to have Jerry back to have another session. He, he's opened up so many issues. But Jerry Mills, well, tell us again. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Jerry. Tell us your your website and uh, how people can reach you. Uh, well, I'm on the website. It has my emails on there. It's, it's uh, B as in boy, the number two B as in boy CFO dot com B two B CFO dot com. Uh, we've been around 30 years. Pretty easy to see us. Google us. Uh, uh, it's very easy to find us. So, and we'd lo- love to help any business owner that wants help. Thank you for joining us, Jerry. All right, great talking to you guys again. Thanks. All right, bye. Bye. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your featured book. I want to tell you about a recent interview I had with Bob Bethel, a turnaround specialist with lots of success in small business. Bob's new book is Strengthen Your Business, Fail Proof Strategies for Small Business. He tells us of his life successes and failures that have made him and his clients so successful. Over the years, Bob has brought 77 companies back from the brink and changed them into thriving, profitable businesses. His energy is amazing, and at 74, he proves that you can still have a great deal to give others if you just try. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. One insight struck me was that most companies do not have a plan. The old Chinese proverb says, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there, is true today. Bob Beth- Bethel's book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz featured book. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2HSA.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees 
improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit cost. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2HSA.com. That's 2HSA.com. Our next guest is, is an American success story. Alex Dustmalchi is here to talk about how, about his journey to success. Alex, welcome to our program. Yeah, good morning. Good to be with you. I just I was just welcoming Alex to the show. This is Dan Perkins. I'm really interested in to hear your story. So why don't you tell us a little about about um, how you how you came to this country, and what you've done since you've been here? Yeah. Good morning. So. Uh, I came to California in, uh, on July 22nd, 1987. Uh, interesting how time flies. Uh, came here from Iran. I grew up in a family of educators, both mom and dad, family of four, sib- uh, about three other siblings. And um, after the Iran-Iraq War, we were here, went back after the revolution, um, after, and, and shortly after the Iran-Iraq War broke out, unfortunately. So as a young man, I, uh, at the age of 14, all young men were banned from traveling abroad. So I had to get smuggled out in order to build a future for myself and not have to end up going to war lines. So I came here in July of 1987, uh, worked uh, a number of small little jobs at a liquor store, worked my cousin's construction company, and uh, I was studying after work. and. Uh, shortly after I realized that this is a place for me to build my own business, build my own dreams. Um, instead of uh, following the path that everybody else followed, I decided to create my own path, if you will. So through a series of learnings, failures, associating with some wonderful people, um, I started a bunch of uh, businesses and I landed on this last one about six years ago where we manufacture um, and we own a portfolio of consumer products and beauty, oral care, personal care, fashion accessories, and we're fast growing and enjoying it. That's a nice outline, but we sure would like to hear some details. Uh, uh, you were smuggled out. Uh, you did a series of things uh, 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 leading up to this. But what what have you learned in in those uh, uh, years? That, uh, that made you uh, the su- success you are now? Yeah, quite a bit, quite a bit. I, uh, first and foremost, I, I kind of never believed that, you know, you have to be in the same box that everybody else has created. I look at life a little differently. And for me, is how can I hack it? How can I come up with something new in terms of innovating? And innovation applies to everything, the way you do business, the way you manage your life. So I didn't want to operate in the same pigeonhole that everybody else did. Um, rather, I created my own ideas and my own path to success, if you will. Uh, for me, having the right mindset for growth and success was really important. And I started associating myself with uh, some wonderful people who had had tremendous success and uh, learning from them on a day-to-day basis. Uh, and, I, and there was a lot of failure. I was never afraid of failing. I think uh, mindset is extremely important. You know, for me to come here as a foreigner, I barely spoke a couple of words of English. And I was the how old was I? Seventeen, almost eighteen years old. Uh, I was very welcomed. It was it was surprising. I didn't know how the folks here in California would welcome me and um, how I'd be able to live. But I felt extremely welcome. I felt like there was some generous, wonderful people in my life that came came to my life and they picked me up and they taught me things. So uh, that was fantastic. And the mindset that I was talking about is the self-limiting thoughts. I, growing up for whatever reason, you know, coming from a good family, I never had any self-limiting thoughts. I always thought that everything was possible, that life is, uh, we basically started our own minds, what we can and cannot do. So with that, the basic rules and principles of running and operating business, I learned that it was pretty much the same no matter what you do. Uh, So applying those basic principles allowed me to become successful and staying true to my uh, 
you know, again, taking it back when we got into the product business, it was at the bottom of the economy about seven years ago. We started off with the mindset that we have to bring products to consumers that we would buy ourselves, that we would use ourselves, that a value that we believe is fair and right, that our family and our loved ones would use it. So I think honesty is extremely important. Uh, not having a mindset of, uh, you know, if you get up and you think something is not possible, I guarantee you it's never going to happen. But if you believe that it is possible, and if you put one foot in front of another, great things will happen, and pretty much everything is possible, especially in today's world. But access is so cheap. Uh, my 18-year-old could get online and he could build a business from scratch in a matter of a few days. He can source products. He could uh, use technology that is widely available and that is cheap. So but in 1987, it wasn't as easy as it is today. Uh, so that's been the pillar of what we've built. And I've surrounded myself with wonderful people. Our team members are great. I feel like if I'm the stupidest person in a room, that's the room that I want to be in. So uh, the people around me are just absolutely great, and they're smart, and they're hardworking, and they're people of great value. Dan, it's up to you. Okay, Alex, I want to I want to step back in time in 1987, mm-hmm. and I don't know how you got into the country, uh, but you arrived. You said you went to California in the first 30 days that you were here what was the was it different than you thought it was as soon as i arrived i lived with my cousins in west la and uh, i immediately had a job three days later at a liquor store right by ucla um i don't know if i'm following what your question was because of again connection issues um but well, you're thought, doing a fine job go ahead well, okay. great Try. great so what my thought and belief was, you know, again, at 17, at the age of 17, 18, coming into a new country and not speaking language, there's a lot of fear. Uh, there's a lot of fear of unknown. There's a lot of fear of connecting with people. Brand new culture that I didn't know much about. I was here at the age of nine. Uh, I was in fourth grade. You don't remember much from that age or you don't learn much about culture. But blending in with the culture and speaking language alone was a challenge. Uh, so I got a job at a local liquor store and I was stocking up the, the refrigerators. And this was brought right by UCLA. And I uh, started picking up ESL classes and trying to learn how to speak the language and understand the culture. That was my first order of priority. Uh, and I was there for about a couple of months. I had a cousin who had a construction company and I was going to go to Pierce College in the Valley. So in the meantime, I started working with him uh, as an assistant electrician to this electrician guy that he had. Uh, and through interaction with people, then language got a little better. Um, still broken today, but it got a little better. Um, and then understanding, you know, finding friends in a place that I knew two people, literally, my two cousins. Um, that was fun, and it was also challenging at the same time. Um, as I worked for my cousin and I, again, worked the liquor store job, I kind of looked around and uh, I got fired, actually, by my cousin. I, Going back in memory, I got fired by him because I wasn't much of a good electrician, uh, or at least he thought. That was a nice kick in the pants. That was the start of my um, thinking that I have to be in business for myself. I want to control my own destiny. Uh, and I learned the trade fairly quickly. And um, at the age of 19, um, I started my own construction company and started picking up odd jobs, which led into some bigger jobs by the age of 20. So I'm a serial in- entrepreneur. I have no fear of getting into different lines of businesses. Again, going back to the principle being all the same. Um, I've been able to apply that in business. And like everybody else, I've had a lot of uh, successes and I've had a lot of failures. But my failures taught me the great lessons, not my successes. I, I think most, uh, the most brilliant lessons in life are the ones that come, they're the most expensive ones. So six years ago, eight years ago, 
you made a, a significant uh, change in your life in creating your new company. What is the new company called? It's called Dust Malchi, D-A-S-T-M-A-L-C-H-I. That's the umbrella company, and underneath that we have, uh, if you go to the website, dustmalchi.com, underneath that we have some um, really awesome brands. One of them is called Vanity Planet. Um, it's an entry-level beauty line, um, 95% female audience, if you will. Uh, we have Dazzle Pro, uh, which is an, an oral care line. We bring products in and compete with Oral-B and Philips Sonicare. Uh, we're typically about half the price of what they retail for. Uh, we have a new watch line called Bradford, um, which is some simple, nice, watches again um, quality is of very importance to us and then uh, uh, value goes right after that uh, we just helped launch uh, one of the orange county housewives uh, had a dream of building her own business and she had it for a few years she was missing some of the infrastructure uh, things that we have in our company and we helped her uh, launch her handbag line her name is gretchen christine so it's gretchenchristine.com and um, I'm having fun looking at uh, what else we can bring to market, utilizing some of the same infrastructure that we've built. So you're basically totally web-based? You don't do bricks and mortar? We do some bricks and mortar. We do some teeth whitening for CVS. We private label for them. Uh, we are in some uh, Barneys, I believe. Yeah, we are in some Barneys. We're in talks with Neiman Marcus and all the other retailers. But... Uh, Selling online has allowed us to not just sell in the U.S., but we sell abroad as well. So our team here is in the U.S., which is fun because we get to create jobs here. Um, but we get to send about 30% of our products that we ship out on a monthly basis, we send abroad. And um, it's grown. We started with sending. We celebrated our first two or three sales. Today we do about 2,000 orders per day that we fulfill. So the business is rapidly growing. Oh. And so you, uh, you don't actually own bricks and mortar. You participate in bricks and mortar, but you're primarily a web-based company. Yes, we're primarily a web-based company because, as you know, you know better than I do, um, there is extreme growth online versus retailers are um, challenged and um, – but you know, having a huge infrastructure and their overhead, and we're able to actually cut costs. That our consumers are able to enjoy that. I, I, I don't think that any product should be burdened with unnecessary marketing and uh, massive retail stores and the rents that come with it. So, uh, going back to the philosophy of the business is again, like how do we get a product to someone at a good value? And you could only do that if you cut all of your unnecessary expenses. Um, so we've cut waste out, quite a bit of it. We're talking with Alex Desmachi. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur. Uh, right now, uh, he's involved online with, uh, if we heard correctly, a hand, a handbags, uh, women, women's uh, various toiletries, etc. But uh, Alex, I'd like to ask you one question before I turn it over to to, to Dan, well, I just saw some figures last uh, night that said that even amongst the uh, millennials, the, uh, they still 59% still prefer to buy in a store, and that uh, 73 to 83% of uh, other age groups still prefer to buy uh, in a store. And you, and you, admittedly, you're growing as are many other people online. What do you think that that means, if anything, Alex? Yeah. So, great question. So, I I don't think retail stores are going to go away, uh, and they shouldn't. It's fun. It's great when people go in and see the actual product. I think that you have to have a strategy to do both online and offline. Uh, so. It's changing. The landscape is changing. Some of the retailers are going to change the, the way they do business. 
and eventually it's a place that we'd like to be in more and more. But the challenge being in retail for us, when we started this business, and we started it with basically nothing, with not a whole lot of resources, and not much in capital at all. Uh, the challenge in retail t- in today's world for people like us that are starting a brand or any young person who's starting a brand is shelf space. Uh, you have some of the massive companies who've taken shelf space and they're doing a great job, but there's so much physical shelf space available at these retail stores. So getting on it, it's going to be extremely difficult. So we took a different approach. Our approach was that if we create, if we do a good job online and we create demand to the same percentage of people that you just mentioned, and if they really genuinely like our product and that catches fire and goes viral, then we have a much better chance and an opportunity to go to retail and tell them, here are our products, here are the people that are buying it. And we've created the demand online because there is the digital shelf space, as you know, is much larger. Um, therefore, after that, having a strategy to have those products on the retail shelves. Does that make sense? Hmm. Uh, very much so. I'll turn it over to Dan now. Oh, I, I'm I'm fascinated uh, in the the uh, as a registered investment advisor and and looking at businesses for over 40 years to invest my clients' money. Uh, looking at your model, would I have still started the business? Would that be the question? Internet wasn't there. Yeah. So assuming internet wasn't there, I still would start my business. Internet is here today. And tomorrow, it's going to change. Uh, the landscape of e-commerce and doing business online rapidly changes with artificial intelligence and bots and whatnot, the way we do business. You were online on the Internet now, and uh, we're looking at a screen. Tomorrow we'll be uh, using our Alexis in our home. We're using artificial intelligence and talking to our phone and ordering products as we drive. So... uh, Absolutely, I would still start it. There, when there is a will, there is always a way. Uh, yeah, the thing that concerns me, Alex, is that um, the data that I've seen is that the Retail Merchants Association estimates that 8,500 storefronts will be closed in 2017. We have seen a number of uh, national brands close their shops go out of business um, and um, so that the retail space is, appears to be increasingly more expensive to even stay in and when you've got 8,500 storefronts that are going to close this year as the internet becomes more and more powerful as a source of distribution I don't think that trend is over I think you're going to continue to see business, big box business close and profits decline uh, big big operations Macy's is, is closing several hundred stores Sears and and, um, and and Kmart went out of business and so that that the whole retail space is dramatically changing but the but the physical experience which you talked about is somewhat important it wraps me a piece of and uh, all just amazing how many stores are empty. I don't think there's going to be no right, and I and and it's it, it's sad in some cases, and I completely get it. And Macy's is having a difficult time, yet Nordstrom's is innovating and they're enjoying growth uh, still. So there will be more closures. I completely agree with you because it, it is expensive to operate a retail brick and mortar store. Uh, the overheads that are coming with that are enormous. So they have no choice, retailers, but to sell a product for more of what is being sold online. Uh, on the flip side, a little bit of that is changing but by you know having pop-up stores. So instead of people bringing in a massive, uh, you know, building in a massive infrastructure and having huge retail, they're doing these little pop-ups. And Macy's has got this. Uh, uber creative space that they're bringing new brands in so it it is sad to see those jobs go away extremely 
However, on the flip side, online, and it's not over, you're right, there's going to be a lot more of that. But then online, as you see, there's a lot of new companies, Dollar Shave Club, perfect example. These guys started it with almost nothing. They had a great billion idea, and now they're a multi-billion dollar entity. Uh, big brands uh, are not enjoying massive growth yet. Uh, again, it's allowing for good competition. Uh, you'll have kids, a couple of kids literally, that come, will come up with a great product or a great idea or a great e-commerce business, and they're able to compete with Procter & Gamble. Uh, so the competition is not, in, in the retail business in the past, it would be some giant retailer would come in and wipe out another retailer. Best Buy, Circuit City, you know, there's quite a few of those. Home Depot came in and wiped out a lot of small businesses. Um, so that shifted and changed, and I think it's kind of going the opposite direction. Uh, you don't see... M m much of the giant business coming in and taking out another giant business or a bunch of small retailers, there's all of these small micro e-commerce businesses that are coming in, but together they're creating a massive wave. They're taking away a lot of the market share from the giant retailers. And that will stabilize. Again, I think that eventually there's going to be a time where people will enjoy retail. The retail experience is going to be a little different. Um, and it's coupled with e-commerce as well. Alex, as uh, uh, the retail consumer uh, and an online consumer, one thing that we have talked about uh, uh, with a lot of people on this program is that the problems that the big box stores have is they forgot customer service. Customer service. The online retailers live and die by customer service. And it seems to me that if the big box stores are not going to get back to serving their customers and caring about their customers in the store, fewer and fewer people are going to go to those stores. Yeah, yeah, you're very right. And the reason for online great customer service is accountability and transparency. Uh, if you go to a big box store and your customer service is bad, what would you do? There's no board for you to go and write your name on and give them a star review. Yet online is extremely, it's, it's a very transparent way of doing business. If you bring a product to market, and retailers are all about, you know, uh, doing business is all about profit, and everybody should be about profit. But if you have a product on the shelf of a retail store and the product is not of good quality, or if you don't get good customer service, again, where would you go? You might go to an online place and post a review that is not, you know, favorable. However, in the world of online, and I love this, I think that transparency holds everybody accountable. Without it, there would be complete chaos. Uh, if we don't operate well, if we don't take care of our customers, uh, immediately, uh, the business is just not going to grow. People, uh, in the sense of community, they're able to see how each e-commerce site performs. Amazon is a great example of fantastic customer service. Uh, I don't know if you buy products from them or not, but uh, I have. A few days ago, I received a package, and it was broken. It was, it was a bottle of this oil. It was broken. I go on the website, and I click somebody to call me, and it's not just digital. By the time I finish clicking, my phone rings, and I get a full refund and an apology. Uh, I'm, Alex, I'd like to jump jump in here and ask you on this issue. The, uh, people talk about that final mile, the, the last mile between you and the, the store. You, you, all of you are dependent, except uh, well, even Amazon, on the, on the various uh, FedEx, UPS, etc. But uh, you, you're in effect dependent on them, them being efficient uh, deliverers of the, of your products. And it's out of your hand. Uh, what do you think is going to happen there? Yeah, so there's great innovation happening in the space of uh, uh, of logistics and delivery, uh, and it's only going to get better. Um, we use uh, a pretty large company, Ingram Micro, to help us with fulfillment, and they're best in class. Um, 
and the way that innovation is moving along and Amazon has uh, is coming in, uh, the industry still, believe it or not, it's pretty good. You buy a product, you can have it in your hand or in your home two to three days. But there are so many great innovations, and the, the entire logistics is still behind, way behind in terms of technology. There's a lot of waste. Now that UPS truck is bringing a product, and I, I kind of see my UPS guy come into my house, and then he comes back two hours later to drop off another package. So there's still a lot of waste. Uh, with the help of technology, with the help of uh, machine learning, they're getting a lot better, and I think that uh, logistics, Amazon has this fantastic service called Prime Now. I've ordered products from it. You buy it today, somebody will go pick it up for you and will bring it to your home. So again, I don't, I'm a big fan of retail space. I enjoy it. I enjoy going there with my family, with my son, looking at a physical product. The challenge is how do retailers, how are they able to sell these products at the same value as you can purchase online? But with logistics changing, they're going to be able to use their uh, facilities as distribution centers, and I believe Walmart is about to do that, where they're going to allow their employees after they clock out, kind of like Uber, be able to deliver packages and earn extra money. Dan, back to you. Alex, what is what's in your creative brain? Is your creative brain for your next opportunity? Uh, the next opportunity is to push the envelope as hard as we can, and uh, not only take the products that we use every day, a lot of products that if you look around your home and products that you use in your daily routine, that's the area of our focus, uh, a lot of them need significant improvements. So we're working hard and trying to improve. The second piece of business that we're looking at is how can we, um, as an American company, how can we establish ourselves better globally? Um, again, with access with the Internet, how can we get into uh, a lot of the emerging markets? Um, and China being one, right? China actually not an emerging market. They're number one in e-commerce. Uh, I wish we had more time to get into that discussion. I don't believe it's fair trade. Uh, someone could sit in China and they'll be on Amazon in a matter of minutes and they'll, they're able to ship products in the U.S., Yet, as an American company, we cannot sell in China. There are tons of regulatory hurdles uh, that made it extremely difficult for us to do so. So that's a challenge that we're trying to solve. But all of our challenges are fun. They're great. Um, and we're trying to overcome them one at a time. It's been a breakthrough in China. Uh, it used to be in China, uh, if you wanted to sell in China, you had to strike a partnership relationship with a Chinese company. And China just recently announced that they're going to lift that restriction as it relates to automobiles. They're going to allow the global automobile industry to come into China and not have the partnership requirements. And a lot of people are interested in how that play out. Yeah, it's, I believe it's very important. And uh, there's no stopping it. It's going to happen right now. People are sending products cross-border into China. Uh, I, I don't believe that they're stopping it at all. It's going to open up slowly, but I, but I, I it's it's kind of difficult when we buy products from China, and they're great products. They're great partners of ours, and they have an opportunity to sell into our country very easily or to to our customers. I think that we have to have the same. Unfortunately, today it doesn't exist. Uh, being partners, even with a Chinese company. Uh, uh, in, at least in our business, in our model, uh, that won't solve it. We would have to file, uh, for instance, for a WOFI, which is a wholly owned foreign entity. Um, after that, we'll have to file a bunch of trademarks. After the trademarks are done, we would have to establish ourselves there for a few years before we can get on their e-commerce platform. So uh, literally there's so many hurdles, and it's so expensive that it makes it almost impossible for a small business like ours. To get in today, Alex, you've been a wonderful guest, but, but uh, we have to move on. We've been talking with Alex Basmaki um, and his journey from Iran to America and to success. 
And again, Alex, your website and how people can reach you? Yeah, we're on uh, www.dustmalchi.com, D as in David, A-S-T-M-A-L-C-H-I, where we have a collection of our portfolio available for folks to view. Well, Matt, a link yeah. to his website will be on, on our webpage, www.recalculating.biz. Thank you for joining us on Recalculating, a program designed to help you be successful. 